We're continuing in a series of six markers of a transformed disciple, and some of these kind of work hand in hand together. Um, we'll still look at them one by one, and it may come to where we do two in one night, but we'll just cover number two. Tonight's going to be a transformed mind. Um, last Sunday, we talked about the transformed heart, and when we come to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, that's what God does for us. He transforms our heart, and um, he, he gives us affection towards Him that we did not have before. Amen. So He does something for us, and along with the heart, next comes the mind, and I don't necessarily uh, think that these go one, two, three, four, five, six in order, but that they all take place at once, or some may take a little more intentionality on our part, but at any rate, these are, um, there are six markers that we can look at. So, why do we need to look at markers of a transformed disciple? Well, if we know Jesus Christ is our Savior, we ought to be disciples. But it's evident in Scripture <laughs> that not everybody that knows Jesus Christ as Savior are being disciples, or at least they're not being very good disciples. I mean, we could look at the book of Corinthians. If you know anything about Corinthians and the church there, you would say, my goodness, those folks aren't very good disciples. Well, that may be true. But that's why Paul wrote the letters, to correct them, to encourage them. And we can look at those today that we might be encouraged and corrected as we are on our journey of being disciples of Christ. And I'm saying that assuming that you know Jesus Christ is your Savior tonight. Um, I do know Scripture tells us that not everyone that says, Lord, Lord, is going to enter into the kingdom of heaven. This is not just about knowing who God is. It's about having that relationship with them. And I say that. I had the opportunity to talk to a gentleman. Oh, was it Friday? And I was prompted to ask. It began with, well, it began with another gentleman <laughs> that was reading a shirt that I had, and it was from VBS, and it prompted him to ask what it was. And this was all God leading up into the conversation that I was getting ready to have with this, this other gentleman we was talking to. And so the uh, one fellow reading them, he was a Christian, he was looking for a church. Um, he didn't come in today, unfortunately, but he was invited. At any rate, it, it allowed me to transition into a conversation with this other gentleman. And I asked him, the easiest question to begin with is, where do you go to church? I like to kind of have an idea what their background is. Of course, his answer was, you don't go to church, and you don't have to go to church to worship Jesus. <sighs> okay. Yeah, well, maybe that's true, but Scripture does tell us not to forsake the assembling of believers for a reason. We need to come together. We need each other. We're together. We have to be here. So that led me into that, which eventually led me to, do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Actually, the question was, who is Jesus to you? To which he answered, he's my Lord and Savior. However, through the conversation, there was not anything in there that really led me to believe that he knew Jesus as his Lord and Savior. But what I did find out is that he had, apparently he grew up in church and he knew the language well. He knew the things to say, the right answers, but there was nothing about the conversation that when I got done and walked away that the spirit within me said, that was a brother in Christ that you talked to. And so it did give the opportunity to share the gospel with him. We didn't get any further with it. I think I scared him because he walked away for a little while and was talking with another guy until he needed to come back and deal with what we were dealing with. <laughs> so why did I tell you all that? Uh, because we are to, as disciples, make other disciples. We need to be looking for folks that need to know Jesus Christ as our Savior, and we may not get a positive response right away, or we may get a response where somebody thinks they are, and we can tell that they're not. Now, do we condemn them and say, hey, no, you're not really a Christian? No, absolutely not. But it gives you an opportunity to lift that person up in prayer and that hopes, in hopes that God will send someone else to them that will talk to them and they will realize. And I hope he ponders on the things that were said and he really considers um, his relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. So that said all that to talk about being disciples. Transformed heart was number one. Now we're talk about a transformed mind. And our primary text is Romans 12 and verses 1 and 2, mainly number 2. And I will read some of these other texts as well as um, they point to it. And then we'll look at some application 
uh, for today. Before we go any further, let me pray one more time, and then we'll look into God's Word. Father, we're so grateful tonight for the opportunity to meet together to worship you. Thank you for the brothers and sisters in Christ here together. And Lord, maybe someone tonight doesn't know Jesus as Savior. They don't have that relationship. And I pray before they leave, they would enter into that relationship. Father, reveal all our hearts to us that we would know where we stand before you. Father, we may know what we need to change. For some, that means we need to enter into the relationship. We need to repent and accept Christ as our Savior. For others, it may just be changing something in our life that's not quite right. Reveal those things to us, Lord, that we might be the best disciples that we can be. And we give you the glory in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. So Paul's writing to the Roman church, of course, uh, our church at Rome in, in uh, the book of Romans, and we'll look at chapter 12 where he begins with, I beseech, or I beg you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your body living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And I didn't give him one, but I didn't want to jump into two without going over one. So verse 2 says, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I wouldn't have to read any other verses that had to do with the mind. We could draw everything we needed to out of that one verse right there. He tells us so much. He's telling us what not to do, not to look like this world, to be conformed, not to fall into the ways of the world. He wants us to be transformed or changed. Change what? Change our mind. Let our mind be renewed. Why do we need to change our mind? Well, obviously, there were things in our mind that were all right. Before you knew Christ is your Savior, you probably had a certain way of thinking. And after you know Christ is your Savior, a lot of that thinking probably come in conflict with what God thinks. And so there has to be a transformation that takes place. And even as we continue to walk, uh, no matter how many years we have known Christ as our Savior, we need to continue to allow God to transform or renew our mind daily. Why? Well, because we walk in this old filthy world, and sometimes the dirt of this world attaches to us, and we need to make sure that we get that off of us. And part of doing that is letting our minds be transformed and renewed by God. Okay? So he tells us, transform by the renewing of your mind that you may do what? Prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Prove or to show it, to discern, to discern that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You know, a lot of times folks are wondering what uh, God's will is for them. Well, He will reveal it when you seek it. When you get in His Word and you allow His Word to cleanse your mind, and when you spend time with Him and you allow Him to speak to you through His Word, and you talk to Him in prayer, and as you come together with like believers, and we encourage each other, and uh, we edify one another as you listen to teaching and preaching, God reveals His will in your life. But the easiest one to know is that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. He tells us that. I don't think there's any more to God's will that we really need to understand except that He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. If we know that that's God's will, then we know that it's our job to go and give the message to everyone and anyone at any time so that they might have the opportunity to repent and be in God's will. And if we're seeking for others to be in God's will, then we're going to be in God's will. And that's pretty evident. There's probably other things that we could say the will of God is. But reaching others for Christ is probably tops of that list. Making disciples. But he's saying as you renew your mind and as your mind's transformed, we're able to discern the will of God. And part of that is being able to discern with the ones you're talking to whether they know Jesus Christ is our Savior or not. Just like the gentleman I talked to the other day. It also allows us to discern when the Holy Spirit is telling us to speak to someone. And as we're listening and speaking, what to say, how to answer. You know, sometimes I get some odd questions. And sometimes the questions, if there's from someone that's lost, it's a diversion from the gospel. And we have to discern whether or not we need to chase that rabbit trail 
or continue on in the gospel, bring it back. I had that take place at a Mardi Gras parade one time as we were handing out gospels. A gentleman's uh, three guys I was talking to, and they would constantly want to take rabbit trails, and you have to rein them back in to where they are. All right. <laughs> Let's continue on. Oh, don't need to go down that trail. Discernment. So let's look at transformed real quick. I want to break this verse down and we'll read these other verses. Transform. Transform, the Greek word is metamorpho, which means to change. We get our English word metamorphosis from that. And we can think of a caterpillar that changes, right? Comes from a caterpillar and changes into a butterfly. Completely transformed from inside out. Something inside takes place that changes the outer. And so when the scriptures tell us to be transformed, we're to be changed inside out. Renewing, the word there means renovation. We're to allow that transformation to renovate our mind, to change out that old, ungodly, wicked thinking and replace it with good stuff. It's to take what's old and broken down and to make it new and restore to its intended purpose. That's kind of neat that they come up in the verses tonight because the Sunday school lessons had to do with restoration this morning. And I said, wow, it's amazing how God lines those things up. You know, we, we, I gave an example this morning as talking to the youth and, uh, of homes after Hurricane Laura and many homes were tore up and messed up and some of them may have come along and fixed up the outside but the inside was never fixed up and it might look okay from the in outside but as you go inside it was never fixed or changed and it needed a restoration to take place. Some of them, like our house we lived on, there was very little damage on the inside, and it was all inside that, took, that, that happened. So there was something externally that affected the house that made it need restoration. And there's no different than we as humans. Something external, sin, came in and destroyed us, and there needs to be something that takes place internally that changes us, that restores us, and that's Jesus. And he says, of your mind, the renovation of your mind, and that's just your thinking and your thought process, your intellect. Your own ideas, ideals, and ideologies, ideologies are changed to God's. And again, prove means discern. That's so all that verse is telling you. Let's look at Ephesians 1.18. Ephesians 1.18, we'll read it. It says, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches are of the glory of inheritance in the saints. When you come to know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your disciple of Christ as your following and your heart is transformed and your mind is transformed, he says your understanding, that's your deep thoughts, the imaginations that you have are enlightened or they're lit up. They're brought in the light. They're illuminating. Those deep thoughts that you have are now have a light shined upon them. Are they in line with the things of God? Are they not? As you come to follow Christ and as you learn and as you grow, the Word and the Holy Spirit light up those thoughts deep within. And as we get closer to God and as we follow God, follow God, it says that we may know what the hope of His calling and what the riches of glory and His inheritance in the saints. Because he lights our thoughts, as our thoughts change to his, we begin to know the hope of our calling. Amen? We begin to know what God's will is for our life, the hope of our calling. Ephesians 4 and 22. And I want to note on this one, going back to the statement I said earlier about not all people who are born, uh, been born again are being our disciples, or at least they're not very good disciples. In this uh, particular book, he, he's talking to Christians, and here he says, you put off concerning the former conversation, or that means lifestyle, that you put off concerning the former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to deceitful lust. 
He's talking to Christians when he's saying, put off that old lifestyle that you have. It's filled with disciples' lust. And he says, lust, and he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. There's that word for renovation again. Be renovated in your mind. Let your thoughts be transformed into the thoughts of God. Ephesians 5 and 17. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. As you follow Jesus, as you study, as you're a disciple of Christ, you can know what the will of the Lord is. You will no longer be unwise. He will give you wisdom. In fact, Scripture tells us, any of you lack wisdom, let him ask. And as we seek God for wisdom and ask him, he will reveal wisdom to us. Amen. Colossians 1 and 21 that says, and you that were sometime alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now he hath reconciled. Our thought process was alienated and enemies of God because our works were evil. But through Jesus, he's reconciled and made those things right. In Colossians 3.10. And I've put on the new man. In Ephesians, we talked about putting off the old man. In Colossians 3.10, he said, I've put on the new man, which is renewed. Again, renovated in what? Knowledge. After the image of him that created him. Renewed in knowledge. As we follow Christ, God changes our thinking. Transforms our mind. That we might know the things of God. That we might know his will. That his acceptable and perfect will. And his good will. So, what does that mean for us today? What, to be an effective disciple, what does a transformed mind look like? It's a mind affected from within by the Holy Spirit. Remember, metamorphosis, changed from within out. And that's beyond the initial act of repentance where we come to terms with who we are before God when we understand that we're unworthy but we understand that we can never hit the mark of holiness, that we have to come through Jesus. There's now a prompting from the Holy Spirit when our thinking goes contrary to God's ways. You've already know Christ is your Savior. A mark of a transformed mind is a prompting from the Holy Spirit when our thought process begins to go contrary to God's way. Something comes along and it might, so the flesh might get excited for a moment. And the Holy Spirit inside says, now you know that's not of God. And that's a sign of the transformed mind. Amen. Amen. We become mindful of how things align with God. Before I was saved, there was a lot of things that took place that I really didn't care about. I didn't care how it affected other people. I didn't care what God thought about it. All I cared about was me and how it made me feel. Well, and how it made my mom and dad feel, because if it didn't make them feel good, I was probably not going to feel good after that. Again, it revolved around me. So <laughs> but after coming to know Christ as my Savior, my thinking began to align with the things of God, not the things of myself. Amen. That's how it should be for you as well. When things take place, our thinking now becomes, am I aligning with God or am I aligning with man? Here's the example, abortion. The world or the culture would have you to believe that a baby, until it is birthed, is not a human life. That it has no rights and that it's an it. I don't like to refer to babies as an it. Well, that's how the world speaks to it of. And they'll be careful to use that terminology and will not use he or she or male or female. They will continue to use it to keep it impersonal. And if you think it's impersonal, then there's no longer anything personal about it. And that sounds mm, kind of easy to think of. But yet, we see so many people for abortions. But yet, God teaches us that we're knit together in the womb. And he knew us even before we were. That's amazing. Every child that is formed in the womb, God has purposely put together. There are 
no accidents in children. They may not get here the way we think they should. The way we think they should. But a life is no accident. God has purposely and intentionally given life. We might not agree with the way they got here. It may have got here by something ungodly taking place. But their life is still precious nonetheless. That's what God tells us. The world would say that unwanted pregnancy is a nuisance and should be terminated. I know doctors and nurses that proclaim that very message to a young lady who was pregnant. And the message was, you don't need that child. It's going to mess up your life. Go ahead and have an abortion. And had that taken place, my life today would be very different. And I can fill you in more on that later if you'd like to know. God's word teaches us that all life is precious. We're to consider the world's knowledge in light of God. And if your mind's been transformed, that's what takes place. You will hear things that the world teaches, and you will now consider, is this what God teaches? Does this align with what God's thinking, just as with abortion or anything else? How about more than two genders? There's another thing we're de- dealing with in culture and in society and worldly thinking is there's more than two genders. Common sense says otherwise. God tells us otherwise. Scripture says he created them male and female. And there's always arguments for other than, well, it's not time for that. There's two genders, male and female. Does that think in align with man or does it align with God? Some of the corruption in the thinking of mankind has brought discord to society. And some of it is taught to be for the betterment of society. I've seen how some thinking has defunded police groups, and now chaos runs amok. I see how... They try to divide mankind by skin tone. And yet God created one man and one woman. And there's different colors of skin. There's not different races. And yet they would have you believe that one is better than another. And that's caused wars for years. Does the world's thinking Align with God's. You consider those things now. And it's amazing how many people will argue for the opposite of those things that are contrary to God. We begin to consider God's will and purpose. Our thinking will no longer set on ourself as uh, set ourselves as sinner. Center. Say that correctly. Our thinking will no longer set ourselves at center. We're now considering God's will and purpose. We no longer want to do what pleases me. We no longer think about how to build up my own kingdom. Again, this is all the mind. This is a thought process. We haven't even got into actions yet. These are things that begin to change in your mind. It's God's will that we love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so all our desires and our thoughts are to be on our relationship with him. He said, does that mean that you're not to have relationship with other people? What about those? No, what was the, that was the greatest commandment. Is love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second is just like it. Love thy neighbor as thyself. There's your, all your other relationships fall in right there. Love your neighbor as yourself. When our mind is transformed, we begin to consider our neighbors. And if we want to be like the one self-righteous that says, okay, Jesus, who's our neighbor? <laughs> well, he's that very one that you think isn't. Remember the parable of the good Samaritan that helped the Jew that was wounded and beat up while the Levite and the priest walked on by? The religious people went by and didn't look, and yet the good Samaritan, the people they hated, stopped and helped. That's your neighbor. We're to love those. 
And we're to consider that in our minds. It's not just something that, uh, not even in the action, it begins in our mind. As, as our mind is transformed, that we see those other people now as someone that needs Jesus. Now we see those people as someone that's going to spend eternity somewhere. They're no longer an object to be looked at. In today's culture, pornography runs so rampant and uh, men have uh, turned women into objects to look upon and women have done the same. They're just objects of our lusts and desires. And yet when Jesus transforms your mind, you begin to see people as a soul that's going to spend eternity somewhere. Oh, man. We consider now that lost people don't act in accordance with God because they don't know Him. When you know Jesus and He's transformed your mind, you're no longer going to get bitter at people. You're going to understand that the lost act like lost and they need Jesus. You're going to understand that Sometimes people mess up, even those that know Jesus, and they need forgiveness. You're going to know these things, and that's the way your mind's going to go. Oh, the flesh is going to want to go the opposite direction, but if you're walking with God and you're being that disciple, the Holy Spirit's going to be in there saying, you need to do this, you need to forgive, and, or you need to consider that this person doesn't know Christ and they need Jesus. Instead of being bitter with them, how about going sharing? I see Christians blasting things about the politics that are going on now, and I'm not going to get into politics tonight, but man, there's a lot of bitterness being spoken. And I'll be the first one to stand up that I don't like a lot of policies that some of these stand for. But the persons need Jesus. And maybe we spent more time praying for them that they come to Christ, that maybe something good might happen rather than ranting and raving and being bitter just like the rest of the world. What kind of difference are we making? It's God's will that we present our bodies a living sacrifice. That was back in Romans 12, 1. Present our bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto Him. So we now see ourselves and think of ourselves as a tool or an instrument for the mission of God. We see things God's way. If He said it's wrong, then we think it's wrong. If he said it's right, then we're to think it right. If he hasn't explicitly said something is right or wrong, then we're to think and consider in light of the teaching of the Word and leading of the Holy Spirit and allow the Holy Spirit to lead us into whether it's right or wrong. There's a lot of things that's not talking about in Scripture. But there's concepts all over the place, and we can know. We don't have to have a list that says, Thou shalt not and thou shalt. When our mind is being transformed and we're walking and following Jesus, we'll know. Our understanding is illuminated by God's Word and the Holy Spirit within. As we read God's Word, we understand things that we may not have before. That's what else that transforming of the mind does. It gives us understanding that we didn't have before. It helps us see things in light of the one who is holy. That doesn't necessarily mean we're going to automatically have full understanding of everything in Scripture. It's not automatic. We're told to study, to show ourselves approved. And so we're to do that. We're to study. But, again, when we don't know, we ask, and God gives wisdom, and He will reveal those things that He would reveal to us. We now recognize areas in our thinking that need to change to align with God. Uh, that kind of sounds to the tune of, we don't try to justify our own actions in our thinking. A transformed mind says, you're right, God. That was wrong. I'm sorry, forgive me. Amen. Too many times we want to say, yeah, God, I know that was wrong, but, but, but God, you don't know. You just don't know what happened. Yeah, he does. He saw it all. He knows. And what he's saying is, forgive a transformed mind now thinks and understands in accordance to God. And a transformed heart and a transformed mind lead to a transformed life. When our desires and thoughts will change, so will our affections. But that is a message for another week. Amen.